All right, welcome to another episode of Beyond Baseball, powered by Prospects Live. As always, I'm your host, Jared Perkins. Uh, excited to be here with you today. Fortunately, don't have Dr. Caleb Mezzi with me um, as he's dealing with some family obligations, but um, we are excited that we are on episode 13, bringing you another awesome interview. We got two more after this one to wrap up season one, and then we're going to really dive into season two with some awesome uh, interviews. Some other things that we got working on too is we got uh, potential World Baseball Classic previews. So we're trying to pull a couple of players from two or three teams, uh, see if we can give you kind of a preview of uh, what's going to be happening uh, in the World Baseball Classic. Uh, in terms of updates for Prospects Live, a lot of good things happening. Uh, got top 30s uh, for each team available on the Pit Prospects Live Patreon. So you get full scouting reports, everything like that if you subscribe. Um, access to the the first five scouting reports and the top 10 are available for everyone. But if you really want to get into those uh, top 30s, you got to get subscribed to that Patreon. Uh, <clears throat> a couple other things, Prospects Live now on TikTok. So make sure to go check that out as well. I'm um, really trying to grow and uh, expand the reach of Prospects Live and all the great work that the analysts, the writers and everything are doing as well. Um, for Beyond Baseball, again, like I said, we're on episode 13. Uh, we had an amazing interview with Frank Calonoto, uh, former 14-year big leaguer with the Texas Rangers, Toronto Blue Jays, a couple other teams. Uh, but now he's the head coach at Hofstra University. So it seemed like the perfect time to drop this episode as uh, college baseball is kicking off. I think Hofstra kicks off their season on Friday. Uh, we'll drop in this episode, drop them today on Thursday. And so I uh, thought it'd be a good time to really bring you this interview. Um, the one thing that really stuck out to me in this interview was how the lessons that uh, Coach Catalanoto learned during baseball and how he's using that now to really develop the athletes and kind of um, help them grow uh, as they kind of approach their next stages in life and things like that. And the other thing is just like all the cool stories he has about breaking down at bats with Carlos Delgado or Alex Rodriguez and kind of how they went day by day uh, and trying to figure out a game plan for each pitcher that was on the mound. So I think you're going to really enjoy that story. I want to keep the intro short uh, just to make sure that you all get to really enjoy this interview. So without further ado, here's our interview with Coach Catalanoto. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of Beyond Baseball. We have a very exciting guest today, 14-year uh, pro with the Tigers, Rangers, Blue Jays, Brewers, and Mets, and now is head coach at Hofstra, uh, Frank Catalanato. Coach, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, we're excited to have you on. Uh, just to, the first question we always start with, just so viewers can get an idea of who you are, uh, talk about your journey, how you made it to professional baseball, and then also uh, transition to uh, a career now coaching outside of the game. Yeah, so, uh, you know, growing up, I was always a big baseball fan. I was lucky enough to get drafted out of high school uh, in the 10th round by the Detroit Tigers. Um, I played uh, five years in the minor leagues and got called up. Um, got called up to the major leagues by the Detroit Tigers and uh, played with five different teams, like you mentioned. Um, but um, I never really had a passion for coaching. You know, I loved playing the game um, and I never really saw myself uh, coaching after, after my career. Uh, but after I retired, I realized that I lost that competitive edge. You know, I loved competing and I couldn't find that anywhere else. And I tried to find it playing basketball or, or um, you know, uh, racquetball at the gym, something like that. And, you know, that was okay, but it wasn't great. And uh, I was lucky enough in the middle of uh, 2018 to get a call uh, from somebody that I knew that was working at uh, NYIT uh, on Long Island and asked me if I wanted to be a um, uh, the head coach there. And I said, at first I said, no, nah, I'm not interested. Uh, and, and luckily enough, the guy persisted and asked, you know, Hey, could you just meet me for lunch uh, and we can discuss this. And I took the meeting and, um, you know, he convinced me to go ahead and take it. And I said, listen, you know, I'll do it for a year, but I'm not making any promises. If I don't like it, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to stop doing it. And, um, I just fell in love with it. I, I, I really, I'm, I'm happy that I took the job. I, I really enjoyed, you know, I felt like I really had a lot of um, knowledge, you know, things that I learned from my time in professional baseball that I could pass on to these 18, 19, 20 year old kids. And to watch, you know, them make that progress 
uh, so quickly and some of the things that myself and my coaching staff were teaching, uh, it was very rewarding. And, um, you know, unfortunately, um, when COVID hit, it shut down all athletics at um, NYIT. And, um, you know, they said, sorry, guys, you know, that we're not going to bring back athletics. And uh, so I was out of a job. And, and it was frustrating because, like I said, I was enjoying it so much. Uh, so I had to wait for about a year or so before the Hofstra job opened. And luckily enough, um, I interviewed and, and got the job. And I'm just uh, I'm really enjoying it. Uh, you know, it's 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 a lot of fun. And, and, and we've had I had some success at New York Tech and, and, and I've had some success in my first year here at Hofstra. So uh, it, things are going well. Yeah, you touched on having success at Hofstra. I was going to mention that as well, um, as you all know, won a championship too, our conference championship. Um, talk about like a lot of the lessons that you learned during the game and how you've kind of used those to help translate to coaching and being able to develop the athletes at the college level. Yeah, a lot of it has to do with um, you know the, the the mechanics of hitting. Um, has to do with a lot of uh, fielding mechanics and stuff like that, but most of it that I'm able to to teach these kids are more the mental part of the game, mm -hmm. uh, which is huge. And I, I don't think that is uh, taught enough to young kids nowadays. Uh, but I learned so much by, um, you know, sitting with some of the best hitters ever. Me and Alex Rodriguez would sit there and break down, you know, the pitchers, uh, you know, not only, you know, before the game on, on video, but also during the game. And uh, Carlos Delgado was great at, um, you know, picking up when pitchers were tipping their pitches, you know, different tells that they would do with their glove or, you know, where they would come set. And some of these things, you know, I'm able to tell these kids, you know, I learned some, a lot of these things when I was, you know, in my late twenties or, or early thirties, these kids I'm teaching at, at 18 years old. And it's kind of, uh, you know, it's eye opening to them and it's giving us as a team a big advantage. Uh, you know, because if if we could figure out when it, when a pitcher is tipping his pitches, um, you know, or, or if I can tell a kid right before he goes up to bat, you know, he's on the in the on deck circle, comes up to me and says, hey, coach, what should my approach be here? And I could say, all right, well, every lefty so far, he started off with a change up. You might want to, you know, sit on a change up first pitch and different things like that. I think it's a it's a big advantage and, and it's working out great. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I know I'm sure Caleb's got a few questions, but I, I, it's great that you touch on the mental side of the game. I work for another organization called Major League University, and we focus on mental side for high school athletes and college athletes. And a lot of them don't know these tools and assets that can really, truly help them in developing their game that's outside of the physical parts of the game. Yeah, yeah it's very interesting, too. We talk to so many guests who always say, you know, Looking back on their career, they take a lot of the mental side out, but probably going in, they were more there for their physical presence or their physical skills. And I think you kind of started with that and then went into the mental thing. I'm keen on just understanding the transition part and like hearing about your journey and seeing, you know, I played and then I went into coaching. You mentioned that there was, you know, a loss of competitive edge or you didn't have that outlet to, to, can you tell us two things? One is, when you were playing, what did you think would happen? What did you think you would do outside of, baseball you know eventually it was going to end you knew that and then while you were searching for that competitive edge you mentioned a few sports but were there any was there anything else that popped up maybe career-wise sales I don't know that you did anything else because um, there was a gap between you retiring and then getting into coaching so yeah so so both questions go hand in hand you know I was always into real estate um, I liked real estate and I thought to myself um you know, when I retire, maybe I'll start flipping houses because um, one thing that I did, be, you know, in high school, I was into a lot of these architecture classes and, and I, I wanted to potentially be an architect. So um, I, be, knowing as my career was coming to an end that I may wanted to may wanted to uh, get into real estate, I was thinking, oh, this would be good. I can flip houses and kind of, you know, use some of that 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 um you know architecture architecture that i like i can kind of knock down walls remodel things you know kind of help the guys that were going to actually do the work you know tell them what what i wanted done move bathrooms around stuff like that and that's what i did i did that for about um six six or seven years until covid hit 
And, um, you know, it was, it was enjoyable. I loved doing it, but again, there was, wasn't that competition. You know, I, right. I, I, I was losing that competitive edge. And, and like I mentioned before, some of the things that I would do uh, to kind of scratch that itch, uh, you know, racquetball, I pra- played racquetball all the time. I was starting to get good in that, but it just wasn't the same, right? I, I knew I had to get back in baseball. And, you know, I've got a wife and four girls. And if I was to get into professional baseball, I would have to be gone for eight months out of the year. Oh, right. So I really didn't want to leave Long Island, be away from my family for that long. Cause I, for the past, you know, 19 years, I was away on the road or gone all the time. So, um, when the coaching job came up, I said, wow, I, I may have the best of both worlds here. I can stay on Long Island. Don't have to be away for too long. I still get to travel a little bit on, you know, the road trips, which, which I enjoy doing, but, uh, it's not like a, a full-time deal where, I, where I'm away from the family all the time. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. I'm glad you answered it together. That was kind of why I smacked you with those two and said, <laughs> parcel them off because I do think that there's, you know, we, we talk a lot about this process and there's this planning that you're like, oh, well, when I retire, when I get my last contract and it's up, what are we going to do? Real estate is funny because it often comes up with baseball players. Like it often comes up as like either I had this money that I can invest if you've played enough, you've you know taken you know those contracts and, and put them to use. Or it's I have a book of business. I know this area. I would like to either develop or sell and get my license. Like there are so many baseball players in real estate. But it's very interesting because you mentioned that you maybe thought that it would give you this outlet, whether it was a creative outlet or a salesy outlet, or you could just flip houses and make some profit, but it wasn't as competitive or it didn't give you that adrenaline rush. Yeah, that's it, it's right. I mean, get and trust me, I'll never get back that adrenaline rush when it's the ninth inning at Yankee Stadium. <laughs> yeah. thing, uh, you know, Mariano Rivera, I'll never, I understand, I'll never get that back. I mean, it's something that I miss. I miss that one-on-one, you know, that 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 competition between pitcher and hitter. Um, and I'll never get that back. Obviously, I, I've got great memories of that. But, um, you know, this, at least coaching, it, it, it gets me kind of halfway there. It seemed like, too, with the competitive edge, and this is probably the competitive nature, but we might all look at competitive edge as something different in our own industries and what we're doing you really valued being able to sit in a dugout and talk to somebody about the craft right like facing this pitcher or facing this opponent or what are we seeing here and how can we decipher what that actually is and doing it with some of the greatest minds now you're able to do it on the flip side because you're a coach and you're doing it with, you're molding these young minds to be able to either start their own careers what i'm curious about is kind of twofold one is how has the game changed since you were in it? Are players still having these conversations? Are they still talking about this stuff? And then what are you doing as a coach, you know, with this future, you know, which is going to be the future of baseball, but really the future generations? Yeah, well, I, I think the game has changed quite a bit um, in many facets. I mean, I don't think guys are, you know, in the dugout talking about, um, you know, how to get that edge as much. Um, um, and obviously it's changed. Like I have a tough time watching baseball now. Like I like it better when I was younger and it was small ball. Now it seems like everyone's trying to hit a home run. There's so many strike game. Um, you know, it's, you know, we have these huge shifts, which is great, but no, the hitters aren't trying to go the other way and try to beat the shift. Um, so it's, it's frustrating for me, the way I manage it is more of kind of a, kind of an old school type thing, more bunt, hit and run, get the runner over, get them in. You know, I don't have a lot of power on my team. Um, so it, it's not like we just sit around and wait for the three run home run. And I yeah. value um, putting the bat on the ball. I mean, I think that's kind of lost. Like, uh, you know, coaches are fine with these guys striking out 150, 200 times a year. Which to me, I feel like, especially at the college level, put the bat on the ball, make the put some pressure on the defense, make them make some plays, um, and uh, you ha- you give yourself a better chance to score runs and to win the game. Um, what am I doing? You know, I'm trying to instill in these guys that um, pay attention because we can during the course of the game. I know you want to sit on the end of the bench and just kind of fool around, but let's get up on the on the steps and and watch and see if we can pick up you know, anything, a 
just to get an edge, whether it be the pitcher tipping his pitches or whether it be uh, the sequence of pitches that he's throwing. Is he getting into some sort of a pattern? Um, and, um, you know, I've been lucky because my guys, you know, have been doing a good job with that. And, and we're not there totally yet, but we're getting there. Yeah, one of the things I really wanted to ask, and I feel like just because of your answer right there is just the opportune time, is I think a lot of what you just said, not only just about the game today, but then how you manage and how you kind of implement these strategies with the players that you have, it's reminiscent of your game. Like, I remember you playing, I you didn't strike out 150 times, but you also weren't hitting three run homers, you know, every game or, it, you know, when it came up, that wasn't your game. I think what you're saying is this is how I approach the game and this is how I'm doing it with the players that we have. One of the things I'm curious about is you've had – you know, this career where you got drafted, but you weren't a top, you know, bonus baby. And then you went through the rule five pick. How are you looking at the human? Because you had to do that internally for yourself as a player. And then looking back at the players that you have and saying like, you know, you're not going to be the first, second or third round pick maybe, but we have a lot of skills that we can work with to make you a good ball player and a good person. So how did you do that for yourself? And then how are you doing it for these guys? Well, you know, for my, for myself, you know, it, it was always, Hey, I'm, I am what I am. Like I, I, I'm never going to be that guy that hits 30 home runs. Um, I'm not going to be the guy that, that steals 30 bases, but do the things that I can do. Um, and, and, and try to do them well, right. Try to put up, put together a, a really tough at bat, get deep in, um, counts, um, and, and try to help the team get to the bullpen, um, you know, if I could put the bat on the ball, if I could draw a walk, I'm, I'm helping my, my, my team out. And, and that's what I'm telling, you know, our, our guys, uh, you know, our, our team, I mean, the same type of thing. And, and, you know, like I said before, I try to model my team and my players kind of like the way I learned baseball and the way I played baseball. Um, because for me, I, I I mean I think it's tried and it's true and it and it and it doesn't go away like that type of baseball is always going to be winning baseball, um, and uh, I, I feel like you know it works and, and you know in two years of uh, of coaching two different teams at the college level it it has it has worked right because I I watch the other teams and the things they're doing and they're striking out a lot they're. Maybe they hit more home runs than us, but, uh, you know, it, it's – we give the team a, a, a bigger fight, whereas, um, you know, I feel – I just feel like when you're striking out so much, you're just, you know, giving away uh, at-bats and opportunities to uh, to not only score runs, but to knock the pitcher out and get deep into the bullpen. Yeah, I'm kind of hoping, too, with Major League Baseball now banning the shift that will go a little bit back to that. Um, you have the emergence of guys like Stephen Kwan with the Guardians that have really – he became an all-star, and he was almost, almost rookie or he might have won rookie of the year, but he has that same approach at the plate. Um, you talked a lot about the success that you had at the, the NCAA level so far. I think at your last school that you went to the College World Series. Talk about how – having that success has really brought that competitive edge back out in you and what that experience has been like to take those teams to those different elite levels. Yeah, well, it's been a great experience. I mean, not only for me, but for the, for the student athletes um, and, and, and the school. Um, the, for me, you know, just getting, you know, just winning the conference this year and just going to the College World Series, um, uh, you know, it, uh, it, w with New York Tech, isn't good enough. Like now I just, I want more. I want to keep pushing, keep pushing because we went to the regionals, uh, this, this past year and we faced uh, UNC and Georgia and they absolutely killed us. And it's a totally different game of baseball down there. I mean, those teams are, you know, are amazing. They don't miss you throw a ball over the plate. They don't miss it. But now it's given me some more fire to say, Hey, we're not there yet. They're up here. We're here. We have to get there. So, um, you know, I feel like a team in the Northeast can compete, but mm -hmm. we've got work to do. So it just fuels that fire and, and that competitive nature for me to say, all right, we went down there. We got embarrassed a little bit. Um, and even in, in D2 with the New York Tech, 
you know, we were kind of a little bit of a fish out of water. No one expected us to be there. But I think these teams in the Northeast can compete. Uh, and, and, it, and like I said, um, we're working hard to be able to prove it to ourselves that we can. Yeah, I think the – so I went and covered the Maryland Regional for Prospects Live, and it was awesome to see more of the Northeast teams in there. UConn was in there. Long Island University was in there. And they're getting more competitive, and that's kind of what you want to see because there's opportunities for athletes in baseball to really succeed in the Northeast, and it's awesome to see. No doubt. Yeah, Frank, one of the things that I've seen in, in your career is you're, you're a guy who plays and you know kind of just carries himself with passion. I'm curious, you know, what passions you had as a player that were off the field that we may not know about and then how you've carried them through, you know, post-career but then into coaching and, you know, what you're doing today. Because, you know, like you said, you're a father of four girls, so you have to have some passions outside um, that you can just have some either alone frank time um, or just maybe enjoy some, some things with your family. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm always going. Like, I never just sit down and watch TV or anything. Like, I always want to be something uh, i still dabble in real estate um so I, I, i'll i'll always do that i enjoy that um i'm always i'm either playing racquetball uh at the gym i'm playing if i don't know if you guys know about this new game pickleball um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm big into pickleball now i like playing basketball i mean i i just I remain active, you know, I, I'm not into a lot of my friends or a lot of the guys that I played with are big hunters or they fish, they're fishermen. I haven't gotten into that, um, but I do like staying active and, uh, you know, I just, um, you know, did, but, but this, this job at Hofstra keeps me, keeps me pretty busy. Yeah. Yeah. My uh, fiance and I just moved to the suburbs and there's a pickleball court right across the street. We might have to start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got to try it out. I was yeah. going to say very similar is that I lived in South Philly for so long and heard about pickleball and being a sport management professor, we're investing really our time and energy into bringing pickleball expansion and all that stuff into the classroom to see like, and students love it because they don't really understand it because they're not playing. They're, they're super youthful and they're, they're in their prime, right? Yeah. But they understand that like LeBron's investing Mark Cuban. But now that I'm in the suburbs of South Jersey, there's pickleball tournaments every day. And it's like these people come out and they're sweating. It doesn't matter what time of the year, they're just sweating. So when you say racquetball, pickleball is the first thing I normally think about. But it's good that you have this active lifestyle that you've carried over because a lot of people, whether it's injury related, they feel like they can't participate like they do. But cardiovascular, those are two really good sports to, to stay in shape. Yep. Yep, it is. And uh, another thing that I forgot to mention, but uh, and I didn't do it during my playing career for obvious reasons, but... Once I retired, I started skiing a lot, and I bought a house up in Pennsylvania uh, on a mountain there. So, so we do go skiing a lot, and uh, obviously, it's it's about the time of year we're probably going to be heading heading out there. Nice. About so. where are you, Lake Harmony, like that area? No, I'm I'm in Mast Hope, which is over by uh, Lake Wall and Paw Pack. I think it's called uh, uh, Lackawaxen area. So, but I I've heard of Lake Harmony. Yeah, so you're not far from like Williamsport, that kind of. Yes, uh, yes, we're not yeah. that far. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting, and uh, yeah, like you said, you couldn't do that when you were playing. But again, that's that's a competitive uh, edge for you. It is. It is. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it gets the juices flowing a little bit uh, when when you're going downhill and you're, you know, you know, you're going down the the black diamonds. Yeah. I, I, you talk about competitive edge on, and I love that. And we've kind of touched on that theme a little bit in the podcast. I, I have to ask, kind of just we wrap into the last couple of questions. You, you had an amazing career, a long career. You got to play with some of the greatest players ever. You were in the World Baseball Classic as well. Um, what's one of your greatest memories from your playing days? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, I never won. I was never on a World Series team. But, um, you know, for me, some of the things that stick out because – I, when I was a little kid, five, six, seven years old, I dreamed about being a major league baseball player. So uh, I'll always remember my my first major league hit. My dad was was there, and um, you know it was you know it, it's one thing to get there, uh, but then once you get that first major league hit, you, you know you'll never forget it. Um, in uh, when I was with the Blue Jays, um, I had a six hit game. I was six for six in a nine inning game. 
uh, and I hold the record for the Blue Jays. That's something I'll always remember. Uh, and then the World Baseball Classic. I mean, it was it was pretty awesome playing uh, in that. That you know, MLB does a great job with it. I think um, you know, it, it it's really really awesome to, to to try to get all these different countries involved in baseball, and it, it really promotes the game all over the place. And to be a part of that, I was a part of two as as a player and, and two as as a coach. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to do the one that's coming up because of, you know, my job with hockey. Uh, we start our season February 17th. Uh, but, you know, those are some things that uh, that I'll never forget. And, and I've got uh, great memories from from my time, uh, you know, and obviously uh, great relationships and, and guys that I still keep in touch with uh, today. That's yeah, awesome. I want to follow up on that because I, I love that yeah. question from Jared. I think – you know, having such a career where you've been on several teams, you've played with some of the greats, and you've had some of your own achievements. I'm curious, like, could you name, you know, it doesn't have to be three, but I was just going to say three things that stand out from playing with the greats. I mean, you mentioned Carlos Delgado, you mentioned A-Rod, there's a bunch of other guys that I know you've played with. What are the three things that stand out that kind of take, you know, this is what it is to be great, and you can take that really out of baseball and, and apply it to life? Yeah, well, you know, I'll start. Carlos, with Carlos, him and I would write down every single at bat uh, that we had in a book, and, and we would we would compare notes. You know, if we were facing Roger Clemens, you know, I would go up to him and say, "Hey, how did he pitch you?" And obviously, we were two different types of hitters. He was a big home run hitter, but still, being left-handed hitters, you know, there were some things that we would compare notes to, and you know, uh, from that. You know, I'm, I'm very organized and, and, and in my everyday life, you know, I write things down at things that I learn or, or things that I see, I, I, I write down in a book. And I, I think uh, it's important. You know, there's a lot of times that I'll go back and look at different things like I did, um, you know, in baseball with the different pitchers, um, you know, with uh, with Alex, Alex and I would um, before the games, we'd sit in the video room and, and um you know, go over different pitchers and, and if they were tipping their pitches and, uh, you know, uh, just kind of, uh, do studying and getting, cause you always want, want to have that, that, that edge, you know, Alex always wanted that edge and Alex, although he was born to be the best player ever, he was also, his work ethic was second to none. And he was in the cage first, and, 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 you know, before anybody and left, you know, last. And, um, you know, he was always trying to get that edge. A lot of people think think like, oh, he just rolls out on the field, just an amazing player. But but no, he, he worked very hard. Other guys like Michael Young, I mean, I got to play with him. He, he's one of my my real good friends uh, in the game. Uh, and, and watching him, he he went and played. Every single day, he's as tough as they come. You know, he left everything out on the field. Uh, if he was out there, whether he was 100% healthy or not, he always gave everything that he had. And, and, you know, it kind of inspired the guys around him that, that might have might have had nagging injuries, um, but, uh, you know, to go out and to, to, to play hard. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of guys that I learned a lot from, but uh, – you know, those three guys were were some of some of the better players that ever played in the game, and some guys that I really enjoyed being around. Yeah, I mean, it's awesome to always hear from guys like the influence that other players had on them during their career as well. Um, and so, just thinking about that, uh, the last question that we always ask our guests: um, if you had one piece of advice for guys who are looking to transition out of the game into the next stage of life, um, what would that one piece of advice be? Oh gosh, uh, you know, love it. Whatever you do, whatever you do, uh, enjoy it and have fun. I see too many people that are miserable doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but for you know, for me, I wouldn't do this job if if I if I didn't enjoy it and if I didn't want to be the best I possibly could be at it. I mean, every single day I'm striving to get better, and I think it's important, you know, to to love what you do and to to uh, and, and, and sometimes it doesn't have to be the first thing you choose. Um, and it doesn't have to be coaching. I mean, but whatever it is, just find a passion for it. 
Yeah, I love that. I think that's an amazing point to wrap up on. And Coach, we can't thank you enough for joining us and taking some time out of your day just to share your story with everybody and how you've gotten to where you are. I'm um, wishing you nothing but the best this upcoming season. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you.